food clean. They sweep their house to keep it clean. They keep their yard clean, and they bury all refuse that might attract flies or rats that bring sickness. They have a good latrine, and they keep it clean. And they keep their bodies clean. These are the reasons why they're strong and healthy. This is why they're happy. Always remember, cleanliness brings health and happiness. today and I'm boiling up some primordial soup. And there is a primordial soup machine. We're doing a recipe for the chemical building blocks of life today at the Smithsonian. <laughs> Welcome to the National Air and Space Museum. I'm Julia Child. And today, I have turned my kitchen into a biochemical laboratory to show you what some scientists think could have been nature's recipe for life on this Earth, and perhaps life in the rest of the universe. Before life appeared on Earth, the atmosphere was probably water vapor, hydrogen, Of what things might have looked like. You've got the sea down there, and here's a volcano blowing its top. Here's lightning, thunder clouds, and the sun. And exactly the same thing happened then as happens now. The sun evaporated the water, which turned into vapor, and came up into the atmosphere, circulated around, condensed, and fell down into the sea again. Something happened to that water vapor when it was up here in the atmosphere. It was smacked by the lightning, by volcanic gases and, and cosmic rays and who knows what else. In, uh, in 1953, Professor Harold Urey had the bright idea of trying to reproduce all of this in the laboratory. And he suggested his idea to young Stanley Miller, his research assistant, only 23 years old at the time. And Miller came up with this concoction of bulbs and tubes. Now here's how Miller's machine works. This is water representing the ocean. And this tube up here leads to the atmosphere. And that was filled with hydrogen, ammonia, and methane and electric sparks. And that is to reproduce lightning bolts. And then this tube leads down again and around to the water. And Miller heated the water, boiled it, and it vaporized. And the vapor went up through the tube here and into the atmosphere and was smacked by the electricity and condensed as though it were rain and fell right down to here and came back into this original water. And after about a week of this continual recirculation, a fantastic transformation took place. The very simple ingredients in Miller's contraption had turned into some very complicated chemical compounds, including four of the amino acids essential to life. Why had this happened? It was because he had added energy in the form of heat and electricity. But this was just the beginning. Since then, scientists believe that they have synthesized almost all the remaining chemical building blocks of life. And they did this by more nearly reconstructing what they believed was the ancient environment. Today, Dr. Cyril Ponampuruma and his students are experimenting with a machine like this, which does look rather like an early permanent wave machine. Yuri and Miller, as you remember, used just water, 
but Panampuruma uses water plus a number of other substances that he feels more nearly duplicate the ancient ocean. And scientists call this the primordial soup. And here is Dr. Panampuruma's recipe for a typical primordial soup. I'm going to make it for you right now. Well, this recipe makes one liter, so you need one liter of pure distilled water. And a liter is just a little bit more than a quart, four and a third cups to be exact. That's what it's in here. And then we have 24 grams of sodium chloride. That's plain old table salt. And 24 grams is just about a tablespoon and three quarters. And then we have four grams of sodium sulfate. Four grams is a scant teaspoon. So there's a scant teaspoon. Then we have one gram of potassium bromide. And this is, it's really is a pinch, and this is a scientific pinch machine. So there we have one pinch of potassium bromide and another pinch of potassium chloride. Another pinch. Nine grams of calcium chloride, and nine grams are is one teaspoon and a scant teaspoon. And then we have 20 grams of magnesium chloride. And 20 grams is four teaspoons. About one, two, three, four. Then take your wire with There, stir it all up. And that's all there is to your primordial soup. And that's what's here in the bottom sphere of Dr. Punampuruna's machine. This is the heating element, and it boils up the soup. I'm going to move this over so you can see. And it comes through this tube, which is insulated to keep the vapor warm. And it goes into the atmosphere, which is ammonia, hydrogen, and methane. There are electric sparks in here, which we'll see later. And then it comes down through this part, which is the cooling system. This has continually circulating cold water. And this condenses the vapor into rain, and it falls back down into the sea. Now I'm going to turn the machine on, and you're going to see how it works. There we go. Now here, here is the vapor. It's being vaporized up here. It goes through the two and it gets zapped by these electric sparks in the atmosphere. Falls down and is condensed, and falls down and is recirculated again. Now I'm going to turn the machine off. But pretty soon, with this continual exchange from soupy sea to gaseous atmosphere and down to soupy sea again, always going through shocks of energy, we're going to be making almost all of the chemical components, the building blocks of life. And these include amino acids, carbohydrates, and some of the components of DNA and RNA. And DNA and RNA are the molecules that transmit the genetic code. And that means heredity from generation to generation in all living things. So this transformation always takes place when you add energy to the ingredients in this recipe. But just think what this means. Starting with water and perfectly ordinary chemicals and minerals like table salt, not only scientists, but anyone, you and I, can go into a chemical laboratory and we can make primordial soup and chemical building blocks. Of course, the next step is how to put these chemical building blocks together. Can we make life? And is this the way life began on this earth? Who knows? And is this same process taking place on other planets? We don't know yet. But according to the laws of probability, it certainly could be. 
So, that's all on the chemical building blocks of life in primordial soup. This is Junior Child. Bon appétit. <laughs> hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. The end of the war. The beginning of another peace. Peace if we can solve the problem of 70 million Japanese people. Here's where we clinch our victory or we muff it. Here's our job in Japan. What does a conquering army do with 70 million people? What does a conquering army do with the family of the Japanese soldier? Fathers, brothers, mothers, cousins of the soldier. What do we do with the soldiers themselves, back now in civilian clothes as part of the Japanese family? What to do with these people? People trained to play follow the leader. People trained to follow blindly wherever their leaders led them. People who were led into waging a war so disgusting, so revolting, so obscene, that it turned the stomach of the entire civilized world. What do we do with the Japanese people when the military leaders they followed are gone? They can still make trouble. Or they can make sense. We have decided to make sure they make sense. And that job starts here. Our problems in the brain inside of the Japanese head. There are 70 million of these in Japan. Physically, no different than any other brains in the world. Actually, all made of exactly the same stuff as ours. These brains, like our brains, can do good things. Or bad things. All depending on the kind of ideas that are put inside. This kid starts life with the same brain as any other kid. None of them was ever born with a dangerous idea. No child ever said as his very first words, me, I can lick the whole cockeyed world. Ideas are taught to a child as he grows old. Teach him the good things, and he learns the good things. When he's taught playful ideas, his brain understands them. Practical ideas, his brain knows how to use them. Artistic ideas, his brain can enjoy them. When he's taught geometry, geography, or geology, he learns them. He can understand chemistry, architecture, engineering, law. Any sensible idea, any modern idea, the Japanese brain, like our brain, can learn when it is taught. And it was beginning to learn these things in an old, backward, 
superstitious country. While living in this setting, while living in a backward world, while still being taught the old time stuff, the Japanese brain was starting to learn the new. And it might have made sense, except for one thing. This group had plans. Plans for themselves and plans for the Japanese brain. With such a brain, with its mixture of ancient and modern, some very interesting things could be done. A brain that thought in the modern way could be taught to use the latest modern weapons. A brain that also thought in the ancient way could be hopped up to fight with fanatical fury. If these men could hop it up, then the sky would be the limit to the things that they could do. They'd gain power glory and a great new worldwide empire that they could control as their own if they were smart enough to do tricks with a Japanese brain. They were smart enough. They did it in a very roundabout way, through religion. Shinto, just one of several Japanese religions, an old religion, out of date, harmless. It had once been the official religion of Japan, but now a tired religion just lingering along with its dim, hazy, almost forgotten gods. A perfect setup for the warlords to move in on. This was the place they would use to hop up the Japanese brain. This religion would become the mouthpiece for the military gang. They made Shinto the official religion again. They took Shinto over. They made it a place where the people had to listen. They filled up the Shinto religion with hokum and use it to sell the Japanese people war. Sell the people ancient nightmares. Sell the people ancient hatred. Play up the bloody fairy tales and pagan superstitions. Up from Japan's murky past, bring back the mumbo jumbo. the emotions of the modern Japanese. That was the warlord's business. Muddle the modern Japanese mind. Hammer the ancient stuff in. Up from the barbarous bygone ages, bring back the ancient Japanese gods of war. Tell them of the glory of the samurai knights of old. Tell them that the soldiers of yesterday are the Japanese gods of today. Tell them that a Japanese warrior never dies. Play up the myth of the goddess of the sun and over and over and over again keep on telling them and telling them and telling them just this. The sun goddess created the Japanese to rule all the other people of the earth. Tell them not to figure it out. Just tell them the sun goddess wants them to believe it. This is her family. Her family of warrior gods. All one sacred family created to rule the whole world. Created to rule the whole world. Make him bow. Make him say it. Make her bow. Make her say it. Make them bow. Make them say it. Everybody bow. Everybody say it. Created to rule the whole world. When they've bowed enough, when they've said it enough, when they've heard it enough, they'll begin to believe it. Tell it to the school kids. Tell it to the bank clerks. Tell it to the farmers. Then start to drill the school kids. 
Drill the bank clerks. Drill the farmers. Tell them that they too are like the ancient samurai. Warriors of today, they will be the gods of tomorrow. And the Japanese brain bought a big bill of goods. It bought just exactly what the warlords wanted. Modern ideas and ancient ideas, both at the self-same time. Fanatically convinced that the Japanese family was especially created for one single purpose, to crush, to conquer, and to rule like gods over all the other people of the earth. And they tried it. All because of one idea that was sold to the Japanese brain. That same brain today remains the problem, our problem. It will cost us time, it will cost us patience. But we are determined that this fact will finally sink in. This is Japan's last war. And we are starting to prove that point by completely destroying their power to make war. There'll be no more Japanese war factories. There'll be no more Japanese warlords. No more Japanese warships. No more Japanese warplanes. But that is the easiest part of our job. Getting rid of their war machine is one thing, but it'll take a lot longer to get rid of their idea. This idea has been hammered into these people's heads. The United States Army can't hammer it out. They and only they can do that for themselves. They and only they can think their way out of this stuff. Our job is to see that they do it. Our job is to watch them while they do it, to watch them for tricks, and to slap down any who try to pull tricks. But the honest ones, the sincere ones, the ones who really want to make sense, are being given every opportunity they need. At the same time, these people, these honest ones, are looking to us to help them prove that our idea is better than the Japanese idea. These people are going to judge America and all Americans by us. That means we've got another job to do. That job is to be ourselves. By being ourselves, we can prove that what we like to call the American way, or democracy, or just plain old golden rule common sense, is a pretty good way to live. We can prove that most Americans don't believe in pushing people around, even when we happen to be on top. We can prove that most Americans do believe in a fair break for everybody, regardless of race or creed or color. We can show that most Americans believe that religion is a matter of a man's own conscience and not something to be used for a political shakedown or to make trouble or to start wars. And by being ourselves, we can show them that though we're normally an easygoing people, a people who like a good time as well as the next man, maybe even a little more than the next man, just the same, we know what the score is. Because we do. We're kicking out the criminals who spike their religion with propaganda. The big shots will never again boss Japanese thinking through Shinto. We're telling these people they're free now. Free of the jailers who threw their honest thinkers in prison. Free of the thought police who kept them from learning the truth. Now, if they want to read the truth, the truth at last is here for them to read. Now, if they want to speak the truth, there'll be no one around to stop them. Now, if they want to hear the truth, there'll be plenty of truth to hear. When they've read enough truth, when they've heard enough truth, when they've had enough first-hand experience with the truth, they'll be able to lead their own lives. Let them think for themselves, talk for themselves, and educate themselves. 
Let them start to solve their own problems. This is what their old leaders brought them. Let them develop and follow new leaders. Let them set up whatever form of government they choose provided. It's a form of government that we know will work for peace. We're sticking around until they've shown us, convinced us, that they've got themselves under control. We're sticking around because we take no more chances. We're here to make it clear to the Japanese that their time has now come to make sense. Modern, civilized sense. That is our job in Japan. In the 60s, he was the first to take the rhythms of Latin music and meld them to rock, creating an entirely new sound. Tonight, it's a great pleasure to welcome him to this special evening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the fabulous Carlos Santana.
football fans. Get ready for the Battle of...